Well, welcome. Today we're going to be covering the Guide to Computer Forensics Investigations. This is the sixth edition. The material all comes from Cengage. They own and control all copyright material. I am just providing video lectures on the individual chapters for my courses using this textbook. My name is Arthur Salman, and I'm going to be working with you throughout this book. Thank you. Chapter 2, The Investigator's Office and the Laboratory. So the goal here is to describe the certification requirements for the lab itself, list the physical requirements for the lab, explain the criteria for a basic workstation that will be conducting the forensics investigation, and then lastly describe the components used to build a business case for developing a forensics lab. So you're going to notice that most of this is all about the lab and the workstations. So what does that mean, the forensics lab? That is going to be the centralized location where you conduct the investigation. Store evidence, how's the equipment, how's your electronic workstations, how's everything. That's where you're going to be working out of. There are accreditation boards that provide the accreditation for the forensics lab, typically worldwide. There are international standards that actually provide the accreditation so that you can say that you have a certified lab. And that means the accreditation will include the forensics lab that are going to be analyzing that digital evidence. That includes auditing the lab's functions, processes, and procedures to ensure that the lab is kept up to standard for performing the investigative uh, actions on that digital evidence. The lab does have a, a manager, and those duties include things like de uh, actually developing the process for managing cases, for promoting a group consensus and decision making, maintaining the responsibility of the lab, the fiscal responsibility, the equipment, the funding, all of that stuff, updating the labs, ethical standards for the stakeholders in the lab, staff, the analysts, all of the supporting group, everyone. That also means promoting and establishing a certain type or level of QA in the processes and the analysis. That also includes setting a schedule that is reasonable and productive. Lastly, understanding kind of how to many caseload or how many cases a analyst can be working on at once where it's both cost productive, but at the same time not burning out the investigator or the analyst. They should also estimate when expert preliminaries and final results should be occurring, making sure an appropriate timeline is met. That includes having the appropriate policies and procedures for monitoring lab and monitoring the lab. And lastly, but most important, providing a safe and secure workspace for both the evidence and the workers. Again, having a safe space for the evidence ensures no contamination. Having a safe place for the workers is also equally important. Staff members, that includes knowledge and training for all of the tools and hardware, software, and other actions that they're going to be doing to complete their job requirements. Typically, that means things like deductive reasoning skills, understanding hardware, software, if they are a digital analyst looking at computer or memory storage, uh, staying current within the trends going on in the industry, things like that. Lastly, work is reviewed regularly by a senior analyst or a lab manager to ensure high quality of work. There are online manuals and information for developing the accreditation for a lab. But one needs to understand that the manager is only part of the equation. Things like a budget is also equally important. The manager may oversee things like funding, but the budget, breaking down into weekly, monthly, quarterly, or annually expenses, are that important because investigators can't work if they don't have the proper funding. 
past invest uh, past investigative expenses so that we can kind of expect what a future case would cost. That is how normally budget planning takes into account. Hey, you know, when we did these types of cases, this is what was the expected cost, this is what it actually cost, and we can use that as a blueprint for our cost analysis. Labs can be expensive. Hardware, software, facility, training, staying current with professional development, all of that is costly, but that's a cost of running a lab. With the manager being able to estimate how many cases or workload the investigators could do, we can use that to examine how many lab hours we can be productive. When we are looking at growth, we need to take into account the change in technology and how that change will infect the lab itself. You could use statistics to determine what type of crime may be more profitable for your lab. You may use statistics to see the time frame it should take to look or analyze certain types of cases. All of this is about being able to budget and plan your budget accordingly. All of this allows you to plan for your lab requirements, the costs, and having a reasonable expectation of revenue. Part of this is going to be looking at like the Uniform Crime Report and other tools in your area to kind of help understand the statistics for crime events in your area to help with budgeting. While setting up a private uh, lab for forensics is feasible, hardware software inventories is always a must. Looking at past problems to see how you can fix them and to grow. Again, all of that builds into the future development for technology and future development for the private industry. With that said, the growth of technology also has to take into account here. Realistically, if you're staying current within the realm of your specialty, doing professional development, staying current with the, ter uh, the terms, the trends, the tools, using the analysis, all of this leads to ways for keeping your lab up uh, to par. There are groups out there like the International Association of Computer Investigative Specialists. They provide the Certified Forensics Computer Examiner, CFCE type exam. This is probably one of the more common forms of investigation. IC Squared does offer their CCFP, which is the Certified Cyber Forensics Professional. They do, uh, they do malware analysis, e-discovery, incident response, and digital forensics. Other networks could be things, or other examining certifications could be like InCase or the High Tech Crime Network. These are not as common. Other training could be done through ACE or Access Data. EC Council also does some. SANS Training also does some. The Defensive Cyber Investigative Training Academy. DCIATA also do some. So there are a growing amount of training platforms for digital forensics, for cybersecurity forensics, for cloud security forensics. These are all growing areas, and there are lots of groups that have specialized their training to better develop the structure and the analysis and the review of digital evidence in their areas. What about the physical space? There are room considerations. Having the ability to store evidence securely is one aspect. But having the room for the investigators to work is also because most of the investigation is going to be done in a lab environment. The lab should also include a way to, to secure and store evidence. That means a safe and secure physical environment, uh, maybe a locking cage, cabinets, camera systems, things like that. A way to control the inventory of digital evidence as well as assets 
that the organization uses. Secure facility could also include camera systems, policies, procedures, everything that would preserve the integrity of the evidence. If, for example, your storage facility is called into question, then your ability to actually conduct analysis might then be removed. If you cannot store evidence securely, then you just won't be trusted. Minimal requirements could be small rooms, floor to ceiling walls with a uh, locking access door with camera systems, visitor logs, and some type of secure containers for organization. People working together should normally have the same level of access. You shouldn't have evidence of a highly secured case uh, in the open where other people can view them unless they are equally uh, the same type of position. Having secured policies and procedures are critical. The staff need to be fully aware of all policies and procedures, need to be tested on and verified to ensure the integrity of the evidence that is in your care. All right, so now that we have an understanding of the secure facility, the requirements, the hardware, the software, how do we conduct the investigation? When we have a high risk investigation, this normally will demand more than the minimal requirements of a lab. So we have like what's called a Tempest facility. They provide a certain level of magnetic, mag electromagnetic radiation proofed rooms. These rooms are expensive and you can use low illumination workstations instead. But again, this is an additional cost that normally you're not going to need unless you're dealing with certain types of investigations. Oftentimes, we can get away with some basic evidence containers. This could be an evidence locker with a lock and key, normally with cameras in a secured room. Big thing is they need to be secured so that no unauthorized person can easily access the evidence. Normally located in a secure area, we limit the individuals that have access to them. We normally have a procedure and some type of record main, uh, process maintained, camera systems maintained. That way, we can track who had access to the evidence. The container should remain locked at all times, and they're only unlocked when necessary, and only for the time that is needed. If a combination system is used, then provide the same level of security for the combination of the content containment. Destroy any previous combinations anytime we are using a new case. Allow only authorized personnel to change the lock combinations. Audit, verify, repeat. Change the combinations as required. Again, we verify, we repeat as necessary. If we're using a keyed padlock, appoint a custodian, appoint a individual in charge of the evidence. They are the ones that are the guardians of that evidence. Stamp secu uh, sequential numbers on duplicate keys. Maybe limit the amount of loop, uh, duplicate keys. Camera systems. You're going to notice I keep saying camera systems, but it's really hard to argue with video evidence when we are dealing with logging everything. You know, you can see who came and went, who had access to secure room, if there are cameras everywhere. Inventory. Keys. Verifying that keys aren't able to be duplicated. Things like that are critical. Maintain the same level of security for keys as evidence. Change the locks regularly or as needed. That means you're not going to have the same key for five years. It is going to be a process that is reviewed and changed when necessary. There is never a master key for several locks. Each 
let's say, secure bin will have a separate lock. That way, separate keys can access certain security bins. That way, even if you have someone gain access to the secure room, they have a second level of lockers they have to get through. And again, if each locker is a separate key, that makes it that much more difficult. Containers should be made out of still, and they should be secured correctly. If uh, possible, a media safe. That's a heavier duty, actual still safe. When uh, possible, have evidence storage in your lab room with the appropriate evidence log, their evidence tracking system. So more than just logs, camera system in conjunction with logs. Layer the protection so that there isn't just a single protection. Layer them makes it a little bit easier to ensure uh, the trustability of your lab and your storage of evidence. At the end of the day, majority of the issues of a forensic lab is they want to make sure that you have the hardware, the software, and the expertise to do the analysis. One. Two, they want to make sure that you can keep evidence secure. You can make sure it's not tampered with or modified and that you have a track record of keeping it protected. That way, you can't have the evidence called into question because of the way that you stored it. At the end of the day, the physical location, the rooms, the security, the camera systems, the logs, the policies, the procedures, all of them help add layers of protection to ensuring that the digital evidence was not manipulated or modified while in your care. There is a certain level of facility management or facility maintenance. That means the, the facility, the lab, the actual physical location has to be maintained. If you put a hole in the wall, you repair the damage. You make sure that the cleaning crew is properly vetted. You make sure that the evidence is secured and not able to be accessed. You minimize the risk of ESD or electrostatic discharge. You make sure that there are separate trash containers, sensitive or destroyed material versus material that can be uh, shredded. Again, sensitive might have to be a secured trash bin that gets shredded through a third party versus material that's unrelated related to an investigation that is just shredded uh, internally. When possible, we normally have outsourced organizations that handle certain uh, disposal of sensitive material, shredding of documents, hard drives, evidence when uh, actually the retain, uh, retention policy has been expired, things like that. Also, again, physical security. Policies, procedures are one thing. Visitor logs. That way, not everyone can be walking wherever they want. They have a strict guideline for individuals that are walking throughout the facility being escorted by someone that is authorized. Having a, an alarm system, maybe guards, maybe having additional cameras, security policies, procedures that are verified and tested. Auditing the lab, always making sure that the policies and procedures are followed. Making sure doors are locked, visitors are actually logged, evidence containers are logged and tracked regularly. And it's funny because we say this, but following the rules that you set forth, Organizations fail to do this a lot. I know that even in the public sector for like DA's office, oftentimes they do not follow all of the regulations until they are called, hey, you know, wh where is this? And I know DA's offices where they never did it. And so they just, you know, 10 uh, years later, they're still not doing it. And only when challenged, are like, oh crap, like we need to we need to do this action. So auditing to make sure all policies and procedures are followed are important.
So now that we have a good understanding of auditing and the physical requirements, let's look, talk about the layout. What's your budget? How big of a facility can you afford? How much floor space do you have? And it always kills me because realistically, as an analyst, you're not dealing with this. This is more of a managerial business owner, business manager type level. But ideally, you want space. You want to have X amount of rooms based off of how many caseloads you think you can handle and how much uh, you can you think you can actually be able to tackle at a given time. If you think your facility can manage three analysts, then you want a floor space for three analysts. A secure facility and room to grow. Ideally, you would want a forensics workstation and a non-forensics workstation for each analyst. They should have uh, both. Normally small labs will consist of one or two forensics workstations total and the analysts share the workstations and then they have their individual research machines. A research machine is just a regular computer with internet access that you can do research and things of that nature. No analysis, no data collection, no none of that. You might have a workbench and storage cabinets. Storage cabinets are going to have spare components, but not used for storing evidence. Here's a nice little floor plan. You have a workbench, forensics PC, a internet research capability PC, and some cabinets. Mid-size, they should have more workstations, a little bit more space for safety. They should might have cubicles, and they will grow. So here we have multiple work, uh, forensics workstations, research stations, workbenches, and cabinets. And then larger labs would be, again, larger and maybe actually segmented so that you don't have multiple forensics analysts working in a room. Now this has eight forensics workstations. This is always what kills me is this is not a small lab. If you have eight specialists, you're not a small lab. A small lab might have three or four a medium lab might have three or four. More than that, then you're getting into a fairly large digital forensics investigative lab. So as we're talking larger labs, that's going to be law enforcement. That's going to be FBI. Again, that's going to be larger groups. And they're going to have separate evidence rooms. They're going to have uh, custodians for evidence management. And they're going to have controlled exits and controllers to secure that digital evidence. And here's an example. And the evidence room is probably not going to be a door. It's probably going to be an evidence pin where you have to go to a window and check in and check out evidence. And then you take the evidence to your workstation, you conduct your analysis, and you return the evidence to the evidence custodian. So we keep saying workstation. Well, what does that mean? Well, workstations for digital forensics could be pretty intensive. So, depending on the budget, you may have a workstation that's pretty powerful. You may have a research station that's pretty low capable because you're using it for internet research and stuff like that. But your forensics workstation is going to be resource heavy. Police labs have the most diverse need for the investigative tools. So a lab might need legacy software, and they may have current software, and they may have a library from old to new. Small local police departments might have multi-purpose forensics workstations and a few high-end workstations. It really just depends. You might have high-end laptops with USB 3 or USB-C for more lightweight mobile forensics. You may have UFED devices. You may have Again, depending on the industry need and kind of what you're investigating, you might have dedicated hardware for that analysis. If you are dealing with mobile forensics, you may have a UFED handheld mobile forensics analyzer. They're a few thousand dollars, but depending on the type of investigations you're doing, the budget may call for it. The requirements are easy to determine. 
basically try to figure out what you're going to be analyzing and you build off of that. If you are trying to take on a case that you are not prepared for, it's not going to be successful. You figure out what type of cases you're working with primarily and your lab focuses on that type of investigation. If we are dealing with digital evidence, that could be mobile forensics, computer forensics, drone forensics, memory forensics, hardware uh, or hard drive analysis forensics, that could be multiple forms of digital forensics and each of those are specialties. So having a forensic lab for everything isn't really feasible. You work in your little niche group. Computer and mobile forensics are two of the more common ones. Video forensics is definitely up and coming, but those are the main ones that you'll probably have the most call for. So that means your lab will probably be set up for computer and mobile forensics. If you get a case using a drone, for example, your lab may not be able to analyze it. You may have to contract that part of the analysis out. Most labs should have cameras, anti-static bags, appropriate cables, appropriate controller cards for USB, USB-C, things of that nature, fire wire, flash drives, sanitizers, hand tools, and so much more. Licensed copies of like hex editors, program languages like Python and Visual Studios, uh, third-party analytics tools, certain types of accounting applications like QuickBooks, Microsoft Office, again, licensed versions. You may also have some form of disaster recovery plan. So if you accidentally are doing an analysis and you screw your workstation up, how do you recover? Uh, virus contamination, things like that. You may have images. For higher end workstations, you might be working with a RAID level hardware system. Again, it just kind of depends on the environment. You will be planning for a certain level of risk. So when you're doing your, a your analysis, you will involve a certain level of risk because you will be working off of evidence. So how much risk are you willing to accept in the process or the operation? If you're working with the evidence, normally you're doing a bit for bit clone of the original evidence so that you can store the original evidence, hash them, and do a duplicate and then verify they are identical. That way you're working off of a copy. That way, if there is a issue, you didn't damage the original evidence you're only damaging your cloned copy. And at that point, you can delete the cloned copy and get a new copy if necessary. You're going to be identifying equipment that has a high failure rate and having plans in place for replacing them. Normally, computer components are a every year and a half to three year under normal conditions. So you're scheduling new equipment pretty regularly. You're going to have support from your manager and your team so that you have the appropriate build case for selling your services. So if you are trying to privatize your lab and you're trying to increase your revenue, you may bring up a business case to your manager going, hey, you know, we can take on more load. This might generate more income and you can present a case for growth. All of this goes back into the investigator. You have to have the ability to plan ahead. That means money, money for supplies, money for tools, for training, for facility, justification for the personnel, having management on board to grow, the budget for facilities, hardware, software, miscellaneous items, hard, uh, the hardware, the computers, handheld devices, and just growth uh, items. That also means in your case, you might have to talk about approval and acquisition within your business case, the upper management, so that you can show how growing your group might be beneficial for the business. 
how you're going to implement it, how you're going to schedule the growth options, how you're going to ensure that you are on track, generate the revenue that you are saying that you can generate. Last part of that is the acceptance testing, and that is making sure that you have everything to be operational. Software, the hardware, the communication, the policies, the procedures, the facility, everything is in place for you to be operational. And if it's not, then you have a corrective action for the acceptance so that you can become productive again. And that is it for this chapter. We talked about essentially the lab and the requirements of the lab, as well as some of the entry-level portions of the workstation itself. We wrapped it up with the workstation, the need for adequate hardware and kind of a use case for how often you should be replacing your hardware. And then we wrapped it up with a business case to grow your lab when necessary. So that, that is all I had for this chapter. All right, now that we've wrapped up some of the material for this chapter, are there any questions? There's a lot of different material covered. So again, the key thing is, as you're going through the material, whether it be the reading, whether it be the videos, ask questions, write questions down. The more that you can engage your brain in this material, the better you are at retaining the information. So again, questions, please feel free to, to reach out and we will go from there. Thank you and I look forward to working with you throughout the remainder of these modules.